Hey, what's up, tribe? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the TFC Audio Project Down Under. So this week, I chat with Jack Mullally, who is a personal trainer and movement coach based here in Brisbane, where he runs his own studio called IDN Through Movement. Jack is a big proponent of natural movement and skill-based training, and he's also now doing some really great work with play-based movement for children with autism, which we discussed throughout this episode, along with Jack's journey with sports, training, and injuries, his holistic approach to movement and fitness with clients of all ages, and the importance of building confidence and skills that carry over into daily life. This week's episode is brought to you by TFC Footwear. We now have a full range of Vivo Barefoot's natural footwear on our website and new stock is set to drop next week. If it's natural footwear for running you're after, we couldn't recommend the Primus Light Range more highly. They're a recycled active trainer that's designed for uninhibited movement. We're also stoked to say we have our own Disrupt FC 0.5 minimalist shoes back in stock too. They're a super affordable alternative to the more expensive natural footwear on the market. You can check them all out at tfc-shopaus.com or head to the link in our show notes. To say thanks for listening, we also want to offer you 10% off. Just use the code DOWNUNDER at checkout. All right, Jack, thanks for coming on the podcast. No worries. So we, so we actually connected a while back, probably a few years back now, through uh, Matt Rutley at Stage 6 where I was training and I I think it was my first, my level 1 move nat training that you popped along to and we met there and then we sort of met a few more times. Okay, because I was going to ask you, because I knew that we'd met through Matt at yeah. Stage 6, um, but I was like, did I go to a class that you were at or, because for context, like... I live on the opposite side of town yeah. to where stage six was, so I would go over sporadically on weekends and stuff. So I was like, oh, did we go to the same class or what it was? So did I drop in with yeah. my daughter, my young daughter at the time? Was that that uh, yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. You dropped in the move nat training and I was like, oh, who's this Tarzan looking fellow <laughs> just <laughs> climbing and jumping around everywhere? Yeah. And, um, and then, yeah, we had a few practitioner evenings at stage six, which were really cool. And um, yep. then we just bumped into each other at the park yeah. recently and cause yep. I think the first time we met you were you were just setting up here at, at Arty Anthro. That would make sense for the timing because yeah, I did my... two yeah. years ago-ish. Yeah, yeah, so the gym's been open just over two years and I did my level one about a year before that and thus yours would have been the one just a bit after my... like yeah. some time after mine. So that makes sense. Yeah, so yeah, because you were saying how you know, you'd love to train out of stage six but it's just like on the complete other side of town so you just made your own little version here and <laughs> yeah well and when i mean there was a period at some point where matt and amelia were like oh you don't want to like move to nunda and coach for us or something <laughs> yeah. do you um and i was like i'd like that but we're happy at oxley <laughs> so um but yeah so as it turns out i've opened my own place about two years ago yeah and here we are we've just had a little play and um like it's a it's a small space, but like we were saying, you can really fit a, a lot into a little space, hey? It's, yeah, it's, so it's like one little shop front in yeah. the shops at Oxley. Uh, it's about four metres wide, about eight metres long, plus this kind of climbing wall jammed in the, um, in the office space yeah. as well. But yeah, it's small, but really flexible with being able to move stuff around and set up different scenarios and stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, no, it's epic. And um, I'm, I'm keen to sort of hear about the journey that you've had with that, but I'd also love to kick, kick it off with just you telling us a bit more about your own, I guess, background, your own movement journey, how you, how you got to here. Okay, um, this is one of those, sorry, I'm very happy to, it's one of those <laughs> stories that gets a little bit, um, there's a bunch of stuff intertwined that I don't really know what leads to what and what caused what and stuff. So I'll blurt out some facts and then we can hypothesize as to how that all fits together. Um, so I was quite active growing up, but in terms of like more formally a movement story, it's probably relevant to say that when I was about 15, I found a sport called bike trials, which is where you ride a bike over obstacles like rocks and logs and concrete pipes. Um, if people have seen someone called Danny McCaskill, um, okay. that, online, that name rings a bell. yeah, I was about to say you're looking blankly at like well, mostly blankly at me, which was not the reaction I expected. <laughs> Most of your listeners are like, yeah, I've seen his videos. Yeah. That really <laughs> rings a bell. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So anyway, he does a more streety style of what I did and I had a more folk, like a comp focused style. But anyway, 
I competed in that, so I started at 15 and I competed through till about 29 or something like that. Um, competed internationally wow. and whatnot, but not, um, not at like the top, top level. You know, like say in tennis, like the Australian Open or Wimbledon or something, like obviously there's the top players, but then there's a whole bunch of people who've qualified and like they play and they're clearly good, but they're clearly not at the same level as the best players. Yeah. Analogously, that was me in trials. Like okay. I competed in some World Cups and stuff. If I'd had my perfect day on a day, I could have like made semifinals or something. But like I was mainly kicking around yeah. in quarterfinals and that sort of thing. So okay. anyway, um, so I did that. And so probably my first interest in more formal training was from trying to get better at trials. Um, because it's a very niche sport in Australia. It's a niche sport in Europe as well, but yeah, it's really say, niche. it sounds pretty niche. Is yeah, it? I got into it through mountain biking. Uh, um, right. It's a niche sport in Australia, so we're all totally self-coached, and therefore it was like, look, got to figure out how to <laughs> how do all my own strength and conditioning right, and right. all sorts. So I got interested in strength training and stuff through that way. I found CrossFit for a while, did a bunch of CrossFit. Um, got hurt doing crossfit mm -hmm. not necessarily so this is one of these what leads to what sorts of things i can't say clearly that crossfit 100 percent caused xyz and like sort of thing it was during the period of time that i was doing some crossfit that i got hurt mm -hmm. doing that but there were definitely other factors like on a trials bike for example you have a you have a massive dominant foot because you're not pedaling anywhere you're mainly hopping around so you have a front mm. foot and a back foot, mm. which means that from a stability point of view, I came, became massively overdeveloped. You know, like my left glute uh, stabilizes uh, well. So my, it's like stable, mostly stabilizing on one side and moving on the other side, kind of like yeah, or like, like steering on the other side. Or? Yeah, so I'm like, I mean, not necessarily steering on the other side, but um, say if you go to hop on the back wheel on a trials bike and jump forward, you'll kick on the pedals, which is obviously force applied by the front leg. So a lot of the t so my, like just my front leg was massively more developed than yeah. the other one and i suspect that um i probably had a whole bunch of twisting instability stuff going on to which i then laid crossfit over the top of yeah and i think that's the maybe it's this, probably maybe that the straw that broke the camel's back potentially yeah. um there's another without getting too much into my own medical history here <laughs> another thing is i had um when i was about 18 i had a condition called ulcerative colitis which is an mm -hmm. inflammatory bowel disease and i was really sick with that had some surgeries and there is a bit of a correlation with that in terms of people who've had ulcerative colitis are more likely to develop sacroiliac joint dysfunction mm -hmm. which was where all my pain was presenting and stuff so it's possible that's laid in there anyway this is not relevant to the rest of the story <laughs> but i told you they'd be some twists and yeah. turns um so anyway i got into crossfit i learned a lot through that but ultimately got out when i you know having a lot of pain and stuff at some point after that i found movenat so i i think i was googling for other stuff like i was starting to find things like Edo portal and all mm. this mo broader movement culture stuff i found movenat and i found matt and amelia at stage six or probably just matt at that point in time i guess um, and so started playing around with that and enjoyed it and eventually stopped, eventually stopped trials riding partly because of the injury stuff. Um, and partly just because like it'd been 14 or 15 years and I was kind of done with it <laughs> yeah, sort of thing. Fair enough. Um, throughout all of that time as an adult, I was working as an environmental engineer and also had a desk job, mm. possibly also big warning signs for the back issues yeah. as well. Um, and anyway, eventually got to a point where I was like, you know what? I want to be more active day to day. Like I really enjoyed the engineering work and this huge tangents we can go down there. I really, um, but I want to be more active day to day. Movement and stuff has always been a passion. For, for ages, I would have said it was like trials riding and bike riding, but I subsequently know it's actually more like learning of detailed complex movement. Like yeah. I love bouldering yeah. now and bouldering is like analogous to trials riding, but as a rock climbing yeah okay. so that's so like having complex movement stuff to like work away at over time so anyway i essentially wanted to be more active and i'd been coaching at a not particularly hardcore crossfit gym for quite a while and enjoying coaching and it all kind of came together that i was like you know what i want to open my own gym and i want to base around movement and yeah and that was already anthro uh, uh, well so i'd been using the ID anthro name previously for my engineering work so if you really uh, dig into that, like deep down in my social media stuff, you'll be like, 
why is there all this stuff about like urban waterway health on this channel? <laughs> True. That's why. Um, so what is Ideanthro exactly? Uh, do you mean like where did the name come yeah, from? Where or, the name come yeah, from, I mean, yeah. so yeah. So what it is, it's, it's the term or the word that I've used as a catchphrase for my work first in engineering and then I brought it across to this, uh -huh. which from a branding point of view was a huge mistake. I should have just branded <laughs> like, I should have just branded something completely new that made sense and that people could pronounce. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's quite unique though. It's, yeah. It's and so, to do that. Yeah, totally. And so the reason, and you, you're almost touching on why, how I got to the name. When I started, when I went out to do my own engineering work, I got some advice from um, like a designer who was a friend of uh, like uh, a colleague who was a landscape architect sort of thing. And this designer, and it's really good advice, but I just missed a small part of it, mm -hmm. was like, you should make up a word, right? It's like for Google search and that sort of thing, you should make up a word. Mm -hmm. Don't like, don't just pick a you know, a, like a, a, a common thing that's associated with your area. Make something up. And she gave the example of our common friend, this landscape architect, who had a business called Landscapeology. Uh, okay. And of course, the thing about that was they'd still kept the core landscape bit of it and like appended something to it and so it worked well for search and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. But you still knew what it was about. I, on the other hand, took the word idea and the prefix anthro, as in anthropology, yeah. and stuck them together and removed an A. And I did create a completely unique word, which when I looked it up on Google search had like only 10 hits popped up. Can you imagine oh, so Google- So were hits? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you about that offline. Okay. Um, but only 10. Like can you imagine yeah. doing a Google search yeah, and true. only getting 10 hits? Yeah. And I was like, this is amazing. I like the word. I like where it comes from. Problem is no one can pronounce it and it has never been well enough related back to what I do. Yeah. Because it doesn't like- it would, if it was movementology or all these other various forms of movement that people like make stuff up of for their names and stuff, yeah. then people would understand. Yeah. But I just have an unsensical <laughs> name that I now go by ID and through movement. So. Oh, well, I, th I think it's cool because, and I, I mean, there's the name and then there's the picture, like the logo of the person yeah. moving. So I think it gets the, gets the point across. Yeah, no, it works well enough. Like there's just a little bit of subtle stuff that I should be doing. Like for example, the sign out front of the building just says ID Anthro with the logo. I should get a new sign at some point that is like ID Anthro movement and then beneath it does like, you know, personal training, group fitness, yeah, just, true. just like hammer a little bit more precise stuff <laughs> yeah. through and it would, it'll be sweet. I'm not going to. I have no plans to change it at this point in time. So yeah, yeah. Oh. And so you decided that you wanted to start your own place, and you wanted it like you had been doing CrossFit coaching um, and some MoveNap by that time. Um, it? So I hadn't coached any MoveNap formally, but I'd been going to Stage Six for uh, sporadically yeah. for quite yeah. a while, and I don't know whether when I got the level one. I probably wasn't serious about opening the gym yet by mm. that point in time. I can actually tell you the moment that I seriously knew I was going to open a gym because these things tend to kind of happen as like, like it might be milling around for a little bit, but then I have these moments of like crystallization. Yeah. I was at a Missy Higgins concert. Okay. And I was like, <laughs> and for some reason I, with my wife and I just couldn't stop like essentially planning how I was going to run a gym. <laughs> and I walked out of that and I was like, um, I think I, I think I want to, I think I need to open a gym. <laughs> so anyway. And so was it a big shift? Like when you started getting into move nap, was it like a massive paradigm shift for you? Or was it just like, Oh, this makes a lot of sense. Like, uh, like some people it's, I guess the traditional fitness industry and even CrossFit, which is like not really traditional fitness industry, but it's so focused on strength and conditioning and big lifts and, uh, you know, muscles and and this and that and when a lot of people when they come across move nap maybe their first thing is like oh this is really different whereas it shouldn't actually be that yeah different so it's just natural look human so movement. i certainly didn't get the culture shock thing that yeah. a lot of people get purely because i was still doing the trials riding so i still had very much like a fringe creative sport where like mm. you know some of my training would be like going out on street rides and finding stuff around the streets to ride on like it's still like very playful and creative yeah. and like pushing at the limits of what's socially acceptable and like <laughs> yeah. that sort of thing. Um, but having said that, 
my strength and conditioning training was much more traditional at that point in time. Like, well, no, I mean, not traditional in a bodybuilding sense, but much more a gym based, you know, a lot of squatting and deadlifting and, yeah. you know, Olympic lifting and that sort of thing. So. And did you find that like introducing the move nat stuff was big for, for either your, like your injuries um, or your overall movement health and your bike trial performance? Like did that, was that something that played into that? Um, it's, yeah, so definitely, this is where it's hard to unpick specific cause and effects, right? Yeah. What I can say clearly is that um, probably the height of me having back issues was around 2013 or 2014 ish um which would have been when i stopped going to a crossfit gym or sub although subsequently my coaching of crossfit occurred through like 2015 to 2018 sort of thing but i stopped like i stopped drinking the kool-aid so to speak in inverted mm. commas sometime around 2013 or 2014 um and then it's been this period where like i am now effectively at the point where my back doesn't give me issues although occasionally it can like i can lock something up it can yeah. flare up and it takes a little while to settle sort of thing so we have this um so i stopped crossfit in 2014 but i was still doing a lot of my own strength and conditioning stuff that had a lot of ollie lifting i just wasn't doing as many wads and that sort of thing so it's really hard to as like as that style of training went down and doing more natural movement stuff mm. it's hard to clearly unpick those and be like look was it more that i stopped beating the living daylights out of myself <laughs> um was it that i had a less sedentary like two years ago that i stopped having a sedentary job because there's another complicating factor where it's like look i worked in an office for a while but then i started to work for myself which obviously just gives way more flexibility in terms mm. of having standing desks and mm. like going for walks during the day and whatever like there's too many factors to say what, but I can say it's like at the end of that, now I'm much better off. Yeah. Like, like yeah. I'm essentially pain free. I do a bit of maintenance and stuff, but it's pretty good. Um, the one other, the one thing that I can say very, very, very clearly is that when there were a couple of instances when I must've been working for myself, but still working the engineering job, where for whatever reason I'd be like a period of a week or something where I essentially wouldn't be at the computer, wouldn't be as sedentary and my back pain would clear up. So one of those was one January, it's about six years ago or something, a friend of mine and I and his brother went for a hike through the Victorian Alps for about six days. Hmm. And so carrying all your own pack and like stuff, so heavy packs and whatever. And so you'd kind of be like, look, for someone who's got back issues, that's a bit of like a, you yeah. kind of expect someone to break down under that situation. Yeah. And I was great. I just got better and better and better the whole time <laughs> because I was like moving over uneven terrain mm. and like just walking heaps. And if being in nature. Yeah. And if we think that like a lot of my issues came from instabilities at the hips and the glutes and stuff and like just doing a whole bunch of walking and different angles and Sure. steps and stuff it got heaps better and then i had a similar incident um about two and a half years ago and this probably contributed to me opening the gym because it was about six months before i opened the gym i for a period of time got a contract with work that required me to go out in the field and assess a whole bunch of a particular type of asset sort of thing so suddenly, so essentially for a best part of a month, my wife and I moved to the Gold Coast because it was for Gold Coast City Council. Mm. And then I was essentially out in the field all day auditing stuff. And then I'd come back and like, we'd live like a Gold Coast kind of lifestyle yeah. sort of thing. Barefoot walks on the beach. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like my daughter was whatever, like six months old at the time. Right. So like, yeah, like wrap up with her and go walking on the beach and like yeah. whatever. And again, it cleared up for this period of time, like dramatic improvement mm. really quickly. And oh, and the third instance of this was actually when I opened the gym. Um, and the few weeks when I was building out the gym before we opened, so being really active, like pulling down the wall that was near where that fluoro light is and mm. stuff. I was really good. I was just suddenly really good during that period of time. And so <clears throat> that's the clearest 
so, so like that has connections to natural movement because all of those things were me going out and moving more <clears throat> like a human probably should yeah. day to day um, but they also correlated with a, a, a me stopping being as sedentary in front of a computer yeah. and even, to, even these days I reckon within a week I see um, you know like I, I notice a little bit of fluctuation in my back health within a week depending on whether it's weekends or during the week mm. so if I have days where I spend a lot of time on the computer it's more likely to get a little bit niggly yeah. And then weekends, it's very rare for me to have issues. Like you kind of almost start to forget about it on weekends sort of yeah. thing. And particularly if it's weekends, but like it would be really active and go rock climbing or something like that. So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I'm not doing a great job of selling like Move Nat, the fitness product, mm. but the broad principles of like, we should, we want to be generally more active and like doing a really broad variety of stuff that's like got diversity in our movement that's consistent with a natural movement style approach. 100%. And that, that is something that we talk a lot about. Uh, we've, we've sort of been using this tagline of restore to explore. And I think that there's, yeah, like you said, there's move nat the practice or move nat the method, which is, you know, a series of different movements that you can um, actively practice so that you can improve your skill and improve your capacity and so on. But the other element of natural movement, I, I think I like to, I like Katie Bowman's analogy of movement nutrition is yep. is really dialing in the quantity, quality, and variety of movement that you're doing throughout the day. It's not like even if you had the perfect move nat, you know, natural movement practice, if you did that for an hour a day and you were still sedentary all day for the it's rest of the day, it's still a big problem. Still be a big problem, yep. and um, you might be better off than if you were doing say traditional bodybuilding exercises maybe but um you you know you might develop more skills and so on but unless you're actively using those skills and going out and exploring and actually being in nature and yeah getting that diversity of terrain and environment and um you know a, a actually applying the skills and capacities that you're developing then yeah you kind of you kind of just i'm trying to think of a good analogy but you're just swapping out uh, one form of supplement for another form of supplement yeah. without actually getting the whole food. Yep. Yeah. yeah. No, and I, I agree. I like one way that I think about what I do in here. Um, and is like, cause I think one of my important jobs is like teaching skills, mm. but is like, yeah, showing people how, yeah how they can take this stuff into daily life or how simple changes uh yeah, sorry i've got i've got caught here because i've got two things running through my mind that i can't <laughs> spit them out separately um <clears throat> so let's get back a minute helping me to understand that like there's essentially all movement is doing you good so sometimes like people get caught in this thing of being like, oh, look, if it's not formal exercise, it's not good for me. Mm -hmm. Or it's not like, oh, it's not necessarily bad for me, but like... It's just neither here nor there. Yeah the, yeah, the thing that I need to be doing is this formal exercise, whereas I'm a much more like, no, look, you understand that like everything that you choose to do is sending a message to your body. And if you are aware of that, that's pretty empowering because you can make choices about like, you know what? it's actually just as valuable for my health if I go and play with my kids at the park mm. as it is if I go to the gym. And possibly more valuable. Yeah, but like <laughs> yeah. very highly potentially more valuable. <laughs> yeah. So once you start to think about that that way, it's pretty empowering. Um, yeah. And so I have no idea what the other thing I was thinking of as I was going along there. Um, so we're now smoothly transitioned to <laughs> somewhere else. But no, yeah. Well, yeah, so I think something... I think the that formal practice can be really good for empowering you to go. Oh, I can I can see how this applies to, to yeah. the you know. It's like you might be doing a formal practice of crawling around on the ground or balancing on a beam or something like that, and then you do go and play with your kids at the park, and you realise that oh, I can crawl around on the ground with my kids, or I can balance on this thing with my kids, and I don't have to just watch them do it. Yeah, um, and it's something that I can actually. 
I think interactive play and actually getting involved is such a uh, such an important way. I mean, not that I have kids, but I imagine, yeah. and it's something that I would strive to do is is connecting with my kids physically. And I imagine that you, like, for, for you, yeah. connecting with your daughter, daughter physically yeah. would be a massive part of your life. Yeah, totally. And I'll be honest, I get confused when I go to parks and see parents who take their kids to the park and then ignore them. Yeah. I'm I'm like, what? That doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> but um, going back to what you said a second ago about yeah people like learning something in the gym and then being able to take that out and see it apply in life i yeah i totally see that and i hear it all the time and i love it but i see it happen in kind of a couple of different ways there's the really direct way that you just described which is like oh yeah i got better at balancing on this beam and then like my kid wanted to balance on something and i was able to do it with them yeah but there's also the like indirect way and so um Almost by accident in here. So we've got like a range of different clientele, but we mm-hmm. have one little niche is we've got a good group of women in their kind of 50s, 60s and 70s coming in and doing this sort of stuff, which, you know, if you look at like the more the move nat trainers and the like, that's not, that's not who you see most often doing move nat and yeah. stuff. Certainly it's great for them. There are plenty of people in that demographic, but it's not necessarily the stereotype of like... Um, the shirtless 30 year old guy sort of thing yeah but um this group of women see heaps of benefit from it and tell me all these really interesting stories so it's stuff like um and it's like it's super meaningful life stuff so like finding it easier to put your underwear on in the morning Mm -hmm. um because if you think about putting underwear on it requires balancing with on one leg so like previously, like would have had to find something to hold on to, and then it's like you're standing on one leg holding something, <laughs> dangling the underwear with the other hand, trying to fish your foot through it, sort of thing. And now they're like, oh yeah, like I just stand on one leg and put my underwear on, and like it's chilled. And it's like, oh, that's really meaningful, and it relates to the balance work that we're doing. But it's not balancing on a beam. It's not, yeah. and it's way more important than balancing on a beam. True. Who honestly cares? Like balancing on a beam's fun, yeah. but who cares if you can, in the modern uh, world yeah. if you can balance on a beam or not? Yeah. Like, it's just it's a tool to get there and it's fun and it's yeah. useful. But yeah, but those you, sorts of stuff. Because you're not going to stand there necessarily playing with putting your underwear on I for ten minutes. But I can't you could say, play on a beam. <laughs> yeah, and I, I definitely can't say I've ever stood on a beam and tried to put my underwear on. Yeah, that might be my next Instagram challenge. <laughs> Are you going to blur this out or are you <laughs> going to have pairs, another pair of, two yeah. pairs of underwear? <laughs> Just don't try and take them off and accidentally yeah. take both pairs off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, but then you also get other sorts of things like I've got a lady who comes who also, um, well, I say works, but volunteers as like a carer for injured possums, mm-hmm. which means that every afternoon she goes out and collects leaves for possums which means she takes the skills that she uses in here and yeah. uses them to like climb on stuff. To, yeah. um, there's a woman in her 60s, I think. Um, I think I'm getting her decade <laughs> right there. But um, yeah, so just seeing like real practical benefits of the stuff. Yeah, so. which is huge. And I think the other cool thing is that it, yeah, you, you can, like you said, it's, it can be more indirect and it can be also just a, a general confidence or like a, 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 uh, a bigger ability to just explore and be like, oh yeah, I'll just have a crack at that because uh, maybe I've done something similar in the gym or it could be completely unrelated, but learning skills and improving capacities in the gym makes you realize that you're an adaptable human that can just have a crack at something and figure it out. And yep. I feel like it makes it makes you more likely to just dive into something and see what happens and not be so scared of either, you know, injuring yourself or looking bad or looking silly or whatever. Um, and you can just go in and have a crack at something. And, and so there is, there is a massive role, even though I think the, the broader movement nutrition aspect is more important than the formalized practice there is such a big role for that formalized practice to facilitate that broader nutrition i think yeah 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 no i can i can agree with that so. and um so speaking of niches in, in in with what you get in here because um you know i think that i think that's such an important niche to hit is the 
you know, 50, 60, 70 year old middle-aged women, um, or just middle-aged people in general, because they've been so, for so long, they haven't been around any kind of movement culture. It's just been mostly sedentary culture. And, and because time takes its toll when you're sedentary for that long, then yep. um, any little thing can be such a huge bonus. So I think that's really awesome. But we were also talking before the podcast started about um, your work with kids with autism. And I, I was yep. saying how I've connected with a few people recently. Um, and I've had uh, Darren Fitzharris on the podcast. Um, talking about it all and I find that really interesting of applying these kind of natural movement principles to people with disabilities so I'm interested to hear about the journey there yep okay cool yeah no so this is awesome and we should dig in because it's something I think natural movement is incredibly powerful in this space um honestly like there's and like there's huge business opportunities in here. Like mm. if, if there's someone who's like interested in natural movement and likes working with kids, then this is such a good <laughs> business space to get into. Um, I will just preface one thing just in case, because sometimes when we start to talk about kids with autism, we, or like anyone with autism, we occasionally run into this thing where like we talk about it almost like it's one package the yeah. autism spectrum's really 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 broad yeah. yeah exactly it's a spectrum for a reason and so you can't like it's certainly not a case of oh, i've met one person with autism so i've met them all like everyone's really different everyone's individuals and stuff but just okay i just wanted to mention or just to recognize that and highlight that because occasionally when we start talking about it we talk about it like it's one thing and everyone's yeah. the same and it can somehow be packaged and that's not the case and it's actually one of the reasons why natural movement's beautiful for this mm. so that disclaimer thing aside um i'll start by telling you how the program came to be so we opened the gym about two years ago and not that long after that we started offering some kids classes and we advertised them and bloody bloody blah and i immediately got interest from some parents of children with autism who were like, oh, the sorts of, I've seen your pictures of the sorts of movement you're doing. I think my child will absolutely love it. Can they come along? Um, and so they did. And for some of those children with autism who came, it was fine for them. And for some of them, the group setting just wasn't appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't comfortable in that setting. There's an indication of the spectrum aspect of this already right because you've got some kids who are cool with the group others weren't um but we could see even from that little bit of those like those first few sessions how the natural movement stuff could be really powerful for these children um but it was the social setting that we needed to change so with the encouragement of one of the parents um of these kids in particular, a lady called Nikki, um, I essentially started offering one-on-one -on -one sessions for children with autism. And I advertised that the first time about a week before the initial COVID lockdown last year in oh, Brisbane, right. got a ton of interest mm. and shut the thing down. Oh. Um, just run into lockdown. You're right. I was like, oh, this is a great idea. We're not doing anything with it right now, are we? Yeah. So anyway, um, and then some period a little bit later, um, as the lockdown was starting to ease, but gyms weren't open again, I got an email from a speech therapist, a lady called Leith, who was like, oh, I've seen your program. I work with lots of kids with autism. Mm. I'd like to start referring them to you. And by the way, they're having lots of trouble with, like they're struggling in the lockdown because changes of routine and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And so she suddenly started referring all these kids to me. And I initially started doing home visits to the kids when the lockdown was on, but you were allowed uh, to yeah. go a few uh, trained outside. So essentially I was doing like, PT in their backyards yeah. to like just comply with the lockdown rules sort of thing. Anyway, um, and it just went super well and we brought those kids back to the gym when the lockdown ended and it's just kind of grown from there to the point where I've lost track, I'll, but I'll say we're probably working with about 
40 kids on a weekly basis, really? one-on-one wow. sort of thing. And that's between me and three other coaches, um, Adrian, Max, and Helena, who all coach to differing degrees each week sort yeah. of thing. But yeah, so it's really growing. And without that much of me pushing the program and like forcing, you know, yeah. what I, like it hasn't taken a lot to to get that growth and that interest. So and I, this is that's something I was talking to Darren about um, on one of the podcasts. Which for anyone listening, I I'd highly recommend listening to that podcast as well. But he was saying he's just through word of mouth, he's really struggling to keep up with demand, and that's what something you alluded to before is that yeah. it's a really great business opportunity because I think in large part because a lot of the funding comes from the NDIS um, yep. and the government and so the, the people aren't out of pocket necessarily but it's something that um, I think all kids obviously um, yep. but maybe especially kids with who are on the autistic spectrum um, can benefit from in terms of their physical abilities and um, their, their mental capabilities as well and focus and, and decreasing behaviours, you know, certain behaviours that um, are problematic and that's something that Darren was talking about was a, a big outcome of doing training with him and is that something yep. you've seen as well? Yeah, so this is why this, so I totally agree that obviously natural movement is good for all kids but why I'm so passionate about it for children with autism comes down to its adaptability. So sometimes you think about natural movement and you think of it and what you picture is MoveNat where, and there's like certain structures like MoveNat is packaging up the concepts of natural movement to make it presentable in terms of what people expect from the fitness industry. Yeah. So things like their combos and stuff are a bit like CrossFit wads and yeah, yeah. you know, they practice movement, like movement or natural movement skills kind of in the same way that say a CrossFit might practice like Olympic lifting skills or gymnastic skills. Yeah. Like there's a certain package fitness element. To it. Yeah. There's a certain packaging it up to make it make sense in the modern fitness industry. Mm -hmm. But if you think of natural movement as the underlying movements and skills themselves and not necessarily the way it's packaged, then you can deliver those skills in a really broad, different, like broad array of ways and for children with autism, that's really useful mm. because the spectrum is so broad. So I've so we're working with everything from um, children who have what previously would have been termed Asperger's syndrome. Oh, yeah. So very very intelligent, um, like like just incredibly intelligent kids sort of stuff. We're also working with some kids who are nonverbal. We're working with kids um, who have a condition on as well as their autism called pathological demand avoidance, which, um, you know, they struggle with there being demands that are placed upon mm. them and you become upset very easily and just like a whole range. They like haven't even, I haven't even got close to touching on the range of different yeah. stuff yeah. there. But what it means is if we think about natural movement in terms of the skills and that what I'm trying to do is expose the kids to those skills, then we can do that in whatever way suits them. So if we have the kid, for example, who um, has really high functioning autism that would previously have been termed Asperger's syndrome, you're much more likely to be able to teach directly to that mm. child so we can actually do direct skill practice. And yeah, because you know, they're a kid, so they're still going to like playing games and stuff, so we still do some movement games, but we can do formal practice there. But equally, say if I've got a kid that's nonverbal, then I can set up an obstacle course that draws out the skills that I think they would benefit from learning, but they just they might just choose to go around that course more intuitively mm. and practice the skills. Now they're probably not going to learn it as quick because it's much harder to directly teach. They kind of have to figure stuff out by a lot more trial and error, or you're just trying to sometimes just trying to demonstrate and set an example and you know, after twenty goes they happen to copy you and you you like show that um give like positive reinforcement to that and whatever but you can just it's just so adaptable or you have for example a child who um you know isn't for example particularly resilient to um to either perceived failure or just gets really worn down by the demands of school all the time mm. and they can come in here and i can literally have written up on the whiteboard like five different options of things we could do today 
and they can come and pick the ones they want. And then we do, like we do those. So they get a sense of control, they still get to move, but I don't have to tell them yeah. what's going on. Yeah. And so they all end up ultimately getting movement, but the way it's delivered is whatever is most suitable for them. And so like sometimes that means I'm like running around in here pretending to be a dragon. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, whatever, like playing some <laughs> fantasy game with the kids or yeah. whatever it is. And other times it means I'm literally teaching a kid how to vault in the way you teach an adult how to vault. Like, yeah, yeah, true. And I think that's, that's something Darren was saying as well. He only does one-on-one sessions for that reason because, it, because it's such a wide, a broad spectrum um, and everyone has such different needs and having that, one, that ability to, to know the kid and, and to know generally what they need and, and their progress so far and you can really tailor a session to be maximally beneficial to, to that yep. one individual child. Yeah, totally. And like we do, we have a, um, a youth group program and yeah, um, the thing with the one-on-ones is that if over a period of time the child in the um, program for kids with autism if it's suitable for them to move to the group program down the track they can Mm. but it's not a it's not some sort of hard and fast goal and certainly not a goal with a timeline it's like look it's an option that's there Um, if down the track they want to try that out then cool they can and if it works for them sweet and if it doesn't then they can go back to one on ones like they can do one on ones for as long as they want to and it's that's okay. fine sort of yeah. thing that option's there um, but I suppose just to like uh, continue for a moment on this flexibility of approach thing to draw that out a little bit more is like um, compared to say the traditional fitness industry where like you pick any exercise whether it's a squat or something else maybe a squat's not the best example of this but maybe if we go like even a bit more bodybuilding like a bicep curl or something yeah. It's kind of like, there's one way to do that. Like, there's really kind of just one right way to do that, which is standing there with a dumbbell in your hand and doing it. Whereas if it's movement that might happen to have benefits for the strength of your bicep, then any climbing movement Mm. is suddenly of use. And it doesn't matter how... I get the kids doing that climbing movement, whether I'm teaching it directly or whether we've invented some game that we're crossing a river and, you know, don't get eaten by the sharks underneath sort of thing. And therefore you're like climbing underneath (laughs) a hole to do it sort of thing. And so that's the, they're all as equally valid, um, even though the method of getting to that, um, that thing that happens to strengthen your bicep for, for, I know that's a terrible analogy, but you know what I mean. Like, yeah, no, hundred percent. And it's something, something that comes up a lot is that sort of problem-solving nature of movement. Like, it, in the, in a lot of ways, we are our brains and our bodies are problem-solving machines. And you know, evolutionarily, a big problem is how to get food in an in an environment, a natural environment where food is scarce yep. um, and runs away from you. Or, you know, <laughs> yeah. And so. I think a big part of what our brains and bodies are built for is solving movement problems and a bicep curl to keep going with that analogy is a movement problem of a kind but really the only thing you need is a, the right amount of strength to curl the weight up yeah. whereas to climb and traverse something you need the right amount of strength in your bicep plus coordination with your shoulder girdle and your rotator cuff and, and all of these other things as well as core function to integrate into it all and it's sort of there's more than one way to do it like you said and that's something that Darren was saying he pretty much does almost almost exclusively well actually I I wouldn't say that but he does a lot of obstacle courses yep and like you said the the, you might do it a certain way you might show how to do a certain way but the, the kid or the individual will find the way to solve that problem of the obstacle course in the way that their body can do it at that point. Yep. And then, you know, with more reps, they might find, oh, actually, I can do it this way. And then maybe with more reps of watching you do it, they go, oh, that's maybe I'll try it that way. But like you said, you're not forcing them. Like, it's not like, oh, that's wrong. You can't do it the obstacle course that way. It's yep. just like, 
let's get through this obstacle course, see how you go. Yeah, totally. And so it's interesting you mentioned obstacle courses because almost always these days when we first meet a child who's joining the autism program, we start off with an obstacle course because it's just such an accessible way mm. to get them in and moving. It's very intuitive. Um, and and fun. We, yeah, like, and fun. Yeah. And we can see a lot about their capabilities and their personality before we actually have to um, choose how we're going to interact with them. Because, like, the biggest challenge with, I think, with working with children with autism is because the spectrum's so broad, You eat, no matter how much you talk to their parents beforehand and ask questions, you never quite know who the person who's going to walk in the door is. Yeah. Um, you never... So, until you've got to know them, even for, like, five minutes or something, it's a little bit of a gamble as to how you're going to engage with them. Mm. But an obstacle course isn't. An obstacle yeah. course is almost always a safe bet as to how to get into that. And you get to see a little bit about their personality then, like straight away. And then you can make an informed decision as to where you're going to take it from yeah, next. That's cool. yeah. um, whereas... It's like a, it's a physical assessment. Um, it's not only a physical assessment, it's like a... Um, yeah, mental slash what is it personality assessment yeah. yeah I mean you just yeah you just getting to know them sort of yeah. thing whereas like I used to start a lot playing games of running noughts and crosses which is also a relatively safe way to do it but there's definitely some kids where that falls flat right. for, for a whole variety of different reasons um, I would never start by trying to teach a skill straight away um, like I would either yeah. I would always either start with a game or an obstacle course, which yeah. essentially is a game sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but it just turns out obstacle courses are the best sort I of thing. There is really something about obstacle courses, hey, because even if it is, you know, art- artificial or man-made or whatever, then traverse when like when you go out into nature, you realise nature is one big obstacle course. If you want yeah. to go from A to B, <laughs> yeah, um, you're gonna have to walk or duck or climb around different things to figure out how to get from A to B. And there's just something so, like even as, even adults love obstacle, like yeah, (laughs) there's people who pay good money to go and do obstacle course races. (laughs) Yeah. And I remember at the MoveNet event, uh, the MoveNet training that we did, then Matt set up this big obstacle course in his gym and everyone had a ball trying to figure out how to get through this obstacle course in different ways and with, you know, holding different objects and so on. And it's just, it's such a cool play-based way to explore your movement capacity in a lot of different movement capacities in one go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, this is a slight segue, but like something segues. you mentioned before, uh, not totally, but something you mentioned before made me think of this. Uh, this, this is on the top you want to talk about, like it doesn't, there's no one right way to do stuff. So before we started recording and we were playing around and I was like showing you some stuff with the rope Mm. where you were sitting on the floor and I was dragging you along. So let me tell you how that has developed. So I have um, a climbing rope, the sort of thing that, you know, sometimes pop up in CrossFit gyms and stuff that people climb. I have one of those set up. I have a long pull-up bar that's about three meters long. And normally what I do is I sling it from one end of the bar and I tie it off on the other so it forms an arc. Uh So it's kind of like a ladder bridge so people can have their hands on the pull-up bar above and then can like sidestep across the beam, uh, across the rope with their feet on the rope and it's swinging around and whatever Uh, and the stuff you can do. But anyway, one day one of the kids um, in here who attends the autism program, he wanted me to move it. Now he doesn't talk a lot, but he indicated to me that he wanted me to move it and set it up in the middle of the bar and then proceeded to start tying it round himself around his waist like a harness Ah. sort of thing and then what it kind of turned into is like he was trying to pull on like he would actually he tied it around and then he started running to the other end of the gym and I was like well this is going to go badly when it comes (laughs) tight and you like he gets like ripped like pulled (laughs) into his stomach so I was like I then was at the other end of it I grabbed it and acted as a bit of a shock absorber but then that 
kind of over the space of 10 or 15 minutes turned into him sitting on the ground holding on and I started pulling him along the ground yeah. like doing a sled pull with but the kids the sled <laughs> um, which was the first version of it and then I switched it around and got him and his younger brother to work on pulling me along the ground which they can do it's actually surprising kids um, a lot of the time even one kid who as long as they're like about eight or so can often pull an adult. Right. There's an, on my floor, which is oh, fake, nice. fake wood floor. It's slippery enough that they can often move right. an adult. Yeah. Um, but then it emerged. So I took those ideas and I showed them to an adults class one night, and so, and then like they fiddled around with it. We're pulling each other along the floor, trying different ways of pulling, different ways of holding on and getting pulled along, sort of thing. Yeah. And um, then someone was like, oh you've got another rope out there. Like, just get the other rope, Jack. So I got the other rope and slung it up and they, like, they laid it out and then stood on it. And then so we're pulling someone along who's standing on the rope now, which is of course we did before. Yeah, it's good fun. And then you're here and you're like, oh, forget the two ropes. I'm going to stand on one rope yeah. and you're going to pull me along the floor. Yeah. And so a lot of this stuff emerges organically. Like I have a super long spreadsheet of different ideas, games and ways of teaching skills and stuff. And if you actually go back and look through that spreadsheet, yeah, we as coaches have come up with a lot of them, but a lot of the best ones is stuff that just emerged from in a session, it happened organically. Yeah. Like the kids started, like there's a, there's a running game that we play with Jenga blocks and stuff that emerged because a kid was showing me how one day how you could set up Jenga blocks to like catapult them. And so they're just like, oh yeah, my friends know this. We get Jenga blocks and we set up like our little catapults and then like you fire Jenga blocks as artillery to knock the other people's catapults <laughs> over. And I'm like, that's a good idea. Let's set up a game where we're throwing balls at the Jenga blocks and running to earn turns and stuff. Yeah. And like... the just little, little additions that... Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, um, but a lot of it, yeah, a lot of it can just emerge spontaneously. From, yeah. and, and not necessarily from the adults <laughs> yeah true yeah it's I do really love that aspect of play where it's it's yeah there's kind of unstructured play like there's structured play like sports for instance where yep. you know there's a big role for that where having certain constraints uh, kind of make it more fun like if you had no outs in soccer then <laughs> you know it could be a bit it, might not be as fun um, or it might not be it just wouldn't be soccer and it would be a bit all over the place um, but having times where you are specifically just having unstructured play like we did before we did, played around for about 10 minutes yep and you showed me what you were doing and I was like okay let's try I'll try it on one foot yep um, and then it's like oh yeah that's cool and then you know we just played around the beam and, and did like beam wrestling where we had to get each other off yep. which was super fun um, but it just it puts you in this state of a well, state of play or like a flow state of like oh how else can we change yep. this game to make it either more fun or um you know challenging in a different way and to just you just feel like a kid again like that's yep. why kids i think are so good at it um or generally kids uh, are the best at it but it's like oh like it, it's this exciting new world which doesn't really mean anything I suppose from a survival point of view or anything like that uh, and sometimes not even from like a physical point of view but it's just like oh let's try this let's try this and you just get on this roll of, yep. of different ways to play and that's I think such a huge way to get more variability into your day you know when we're talking about movement nutrition yeah totally yeah yeah look I and I try and encourage this, even in the adults classes where like, yeah, there's some more structure to this because like it's a group of adults and stuff. But even then, I'm very happy for people to, within the broad framework of what we're doing, to get really quite creative. And so actually one of our members, a guy called Ben, is very, very good at this. Actually, I'd, I'd probably say that like, in terms of the spreadsheet that I mentioned before, in terms of ideas of stuff, it's probably like, <laughs> mostly um, like most of the ideas from the coaches because this is like what we do sort yeah. of thing lots of ideas from the kids and then Ben <laughs> is the rest of the ideas in there 50, 25, 25 kind something, of split. <laughs> something like that maybe not quite but close <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah like he's just a creative guy and I just let him express that like so if we're doing balance then he knows that I'm pretty cool even though like I might give some direction like look 
we're going to practice like these general balance things or whatever but he knows that it's totally cool if he wants to go get the Jenga blocks and yeah. whatever and start like like if I don't know if we're doing balance split squatting and then he wants to get the Jenga blocks and try X, Y, Z while balance split squatting or whatever it is like yeah. um, that's totally cool and I try and encourage that because I think it just makes the um, like may, like sometimes it maybe makes the individual moment a little bit more chaotic um, but long term it makes the whole thing much much better because mm. it's helping us to grow and to find new ways of teaching things and yeah. whatever so and it's a vibe kind of thing like yeah. I'm sure all these people are aware that they're not going to get that kind of environment <laughs> at a traditional gym yeah. and that's why they come here yeah no one's want... no one's coming here because they want a traditional gym yeah. so yeah which is pretty cool and there's not that there's not very many places out there like yours like really the only place I was aware of was stage 6 um, and they're, yeah. they're now since closed and obviously since COVID and um, it's it's quite a rare thing but I think such an important thing it's like an I mean obviously you have kids in here but to have a playground for adults or kids that you can just yeah like you can get some some mad fitness going in a playground like this yeah but you can also just play and yeah. like having a um just having a, a small like a, just a spot that you can go to do that i think that would be such a highlight in the people's lives who come here yeah i imagine yeah yeah i mean it certainly seems to yeah. be so yeah because it it's so I just feel like it's so hard, hardwired into us, uh, the this aspect of play. Like the, I, th- I can't remember who I was talking about it to the other day, but we often hear this. I guess this narrative or this concept, which definitely is ha- has some truth that, um, you know, we want to conserve energy from an evolutionary point of view. We want to conserve as much energy as possible. Um, yeah, we don't need to use energy so that we can survive when food is scarce kind of thing and and that is a way of saying you know you need to be really disciplined and a lot of people use it in the context of like you you need to fight against this natural urge to conserve energy and be really disciplined and keep motivated to keep exercising and losing weight and this and that whereas play is the other this other evolutionary driver that um makes us really happy to move like it's it's something that actually gives us we our brain literally provides us happy chemicals to for doing this movement and playing with movement Mm. and so it it sort of bypasses that need to be disciplined and and motivated and it's it's its own thing yeah so it's interesting because i because i do talk about like the said principle and stuff a bit like in the context of that um yeah like saving of energy and Mm. like conserving energy and the like I've never I personally haven't taken it or thought about it in the context of then being like oh and therefore we must be disciplined so I normally talk about that sort of thing in the context of uh, like efficiency uh, almost like um, here's the reason you're body has let has like you've lost that skill so people um or or like i mean i initially started talking about it when i was kind of a bit more into like the crossfit realm and stuff like why your body gets tight hip flexors if you sit all the time well it's like because it's trying to be efficient with energy if you're not actually extending your hip your body's like why do i need to be able to extend my hip yeah sort of thing um i've never i haven't previously thought about that in the context of yeah okay if i'm if my body's trying to be efficient and lazy i have to fight against that i I mean i see i see the logic in that i think that's sort of the traditional fitness kind of narrative of like yeah yeah like you have to you have to because that this thing exists then you have to fight against that and you know and just do do the work and just push past that and get disciplined and routined whereas i think play is this this sort of cheat code where you can just plug that in and, and you get all this you know this other evolutionary drive to move other rather than conserve energy yeah and look and i certainly get that because one of the things that i um have come to realize over time is that when i was riding like uh, the tri- like riding trials all the time i had no dramas ever like 
managing what I ate. Yeah. So I could just like, um, and I didn't eat perfect all the time. Like I'd go through periods where I would like eat more stuff that wasn't super healthy, but then periods like leaning up to competitions where I was clearly aiming to perform where I'd be like, nah, like I'm eating incredibly healthy in the lead up mm. to this and stuff. Mm. But the important thing, the things relevant here was that none of that was ever a struggle because the drive to be good on the trials bike was so strong that it just didn't even make, it wasn't even a matter of willpower yeah. sort of thing. It was just like, oh no, like it's just like this thing's just so cool and so important to me yeah. that of course I will eat this way at this point in time. Yeah. And so, and I think that like in a certain way ties in with what you're saying in the sense of like, yeah, if you can find stuff that's so fulfilling in its own right and like maybe that's play sort of thing, mm. then it takes away the need for willpower Yeah, because yeah. it's just, because the thing you were trying to achieve with willpower is actually just so blatantly obvious the, lead the right choice. Yeah. Once you get to there... Yeah, no, it's not 100% um, the same as what you're saying because like, I, I get that but it just it feels like there's something there yeah, maybe I need 100%. longer to know yeah. how to articulate that well it's like yeah if something's fulfilling and meaningful um, and has a purpose to you or, or just really fun and enjoyable yeah there's not that same like oh I gotta drag myself out of bed and go to the gym or you know like oh, I have to like like that sort of oh, I have to go and go to the gym after work versus for me it's like oh sweet I get to go down to the park and play hockey side. yeah you know? well this is I mean, this is exactly the thing that um, the fellow Ben that I mentioned before he says that he's like uh, he said multiple times in sessions like new members and stuff in here being like oh yeah like I just never miss a session like I've done the traditional gym thing and it was always exactly that struggle yeah and now that I come here like it's just not a question yeah I just come sort yeah. of thing and it really because it's it. fun yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's it's in our, in my bubble. Um, then that's very common. Like a lot of people are into that play because you know you buy the Traxi Tribe, I suppose, and and everything. But in the fitness industry at, at large, it's I think that's really missing. And it's this it, it's this sort of oh, if you miss a session, then you're you know you're lazy or you know yeah. And there, yeah, there and are that's some extreme. yeah, but there are some mental hangups where. Um, like this whole thing where where the fitness industry sells this thought that like essentially if you're not working super hard and you don't feel wrecked at the end of it then mm. you haven't done anything valuable yeah and sort of like and you're just like oh it's so totally missing the point <laughs> yeah like uh, yeah <laughs> it's it's just very different and I do think people it can take a little bit of time for people to adjust. Like I'm really aware that when I go out and post, like say you, um, I was saying to you before, I think before we started recording that uh, a lot of my interest in the gyms comes from me posting stuff into like the local community groups mm, on Facebook. Mm. Um, but I, and so I get lots of interest there and I can clearly see that that's connecting with people. But I'm also aware that there's probably a heck of a lot of people who see my posts that are just like, what the heck is he on about? Yeah. Like, yeah. And where it's just, and that's totally fine. Like everyone's got their own life experience and desires and stuff. But I don't think we should kid ourselves that as cool as we think this stuff is, it's still very niche. 100%. It's still incredibly niche. I know, yeah. Um, and I definitely yeah. get, um, I know that people can come to this who aren't necessarily predisposed to the playful side of it. And then once they're exposed to it, be like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. That's pretty good. Because I've had a few people come along who were like, um, bought, as, bought along as like friends of other members. And I'm talking about adults and stuff here. Um, like friends of other members and so, who kind of came along because they were bought by someone else yeah. sort of thing. But then have after a little bit of time into it being like oh no okay i get it now yeah like I, they almost certainly would not have come in their own right um alone sort of thing yeah but once they were bought and experienced it um 
then they're starting to feel like, oh, this, and they're making their own connections to why this stuff's so important. And mm. um, yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. And I think, yeah, there's a certain population that would just be like, no way, I'm not, not doing that thing. They're just too Well, that's the same with else. anything. And the right. same with anything, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But you're right, it is, <clears throat> it is quite niche and it's, it is strange that it is niche. Like, it, it's interesting that the human species has come this far that playing with movement and hanging and balancing and jumping around and things like that are, are weird and niche. I, so, yeah, so I don't necessarily think that it's strange that it got to that point. So like I look at it and be like, look at the course of human history and I'm like, oh no, like I get why it got to that point. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it's right or optimum, but I can totally see how societal how pressures shape us in that like has shaped us into this for sure spot yeah. um, I, I just clarify that because sometimes you know like you start to talk about these things and people will be like I just don't understand how it's this way and I'm like is it that you don't understand how yeah, it's this way or is it that you just see it so differently yeah. that you're like like yeah that you're just like I wish everyone would see it my way and it comes yeah. out as I don't understand yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so but I, and no, I realise sure. I realise if you, you look at human history it, it makes sense how we got here yeah and yet it just doesn't mean it's optimal like, yeah and yet it, it's in, I guess in some sense it is still strange because uh, because I feel like for most people like you said once they do experience it and they make that connection they're like Oh, like it all makes sense because deep, like on a deeper physiological level, then their body does crave that type of input. Um, yeah. And yet, it's just I think it, yeah, it's probably just a, literally a lack of experience of of people doing those things and being exposed to that kind of activity and play. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, we're, yeah, we're shaped by our environment and exactly. all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so we we just count ourselves lucky that we had. Someone to show us how to play and <laughs> well, yeah. But the other thing, and I do realize that we should wrap up soon because yeah, we're near yeah. near the time. But um, I'll tell you one little story, and then is I'm aware that as much as because you just said something like, "Oh, we're super lucky that someone like that we stumbled across this, or someone was able to show us this, or yeah. whatnot," which I agree with entirely. But I am also acutely aware of the fact that there are probably many other things that I could also find really meaningful in a similar way mm. that I haven't been exposed to and that's not necessarily a problem because you only have so much time in your life and so the analogy here is um, when I used to work as an environmental engineer I for a period of time I worked for a not-for-profit organization and we were sitting there one day having this conversation about like essentially how to get people to not litter with plastics in a way that would end up in waterways. Yeah. And during that conversation, someone got up and went to the printer and printed out some enormous stack of paper. And I was like, you realize that somewhere, like probably in Brisbane right now, there's probably a not-for-profit sitting around <laughs> talking about how to get people not to print out huge stacks of paper. Yeah. And so it's a bit like, oh... Yeah, we all have it. So that's kind of like an, a flip side opposite of this. But it's like, there's... Mm, yeah, it's... I think what's most important is that we all try and find something that's super valuable and super fulfilling to us. And so for you and me, that happens to be movement in mm. this space. And other people who I can expose that to and also get that from, I'm like, cool. But... I don't harbour any desires these days. I probably would have thought differently back in my environmental engineering days sort of thing, but I don't harbour any um, feelings these days that the whole world should be getting the same meaning from movement that I am. Mm, I would like everyone to get meaning from something that's yeah. right for them. And I do think obviously there are some really good health benefits to the natural movement like it does happen to make a lot of sense from that point of view um, uh, yeah. but, but if someone I don't know if someone found that they got huge amounts of fulfilment from music and happened to just want to do their much more traditional 
exercises to keep themselves tracking. Um, I'm I'm like I'm cool with that. Yeah. I really I don't feel any need to preach and to try and push my love of movement onto I get them. You. Don't get me wrong. If they walk through the door and I'd be like, "Huh, I saw your thing. It looks interesting." I um, preach. To I want to give it a go. I'll be like, "Oh well, I clearly want to show this person the best experience they can." Yeah. But I don't feel the need to go out and be like, "Oh no." Movements like the thing. <laughs> yeah, I, like, <laughs> I, I, um, I definitely know what you're saying. It's, I think movement. There are like, yeah, for you and I, it's such a huge part of our lives and gives us a lot of meaning. And, and not everyone can get that same amount of meaning from movement. I think, but at the same time, whatever, whatever people do find meaning in moving. Practicing movement, I think, in a, in a natural way, and especially getting more movement into your, into your day, will make you better at that thing, yeah. I, and it'll make you more able to do it for longer. Because I, I think, especially for me, I'm, I'm probably a bit jaded by my experience in nursing homes and hospitals and things where I see the effects of people being sedentary yep. and people chasing meaning and things that aren't movement. Yep. And I think I, I do think movement is is like there's so many different niche areas to find meaning in but movement is one area that can be a lot more universal yeah almost everyone could find yep. more meaning in it and i will clarify this by saying one thing so i don't to come to a more fitness example i don't necessarily feel the need to say if someone yeah so maybe the music example isn't the best one but maybe if my example was if someone just really likes going and doing like so let's say CrossFit style yeah, workouts, right. right? I don't really have any desire to convince them otherwise mm, sort of mm. thing. What I am passionate about though is there is a huge proportion of the population who want to do stuff to make themselves healthy yeah. but who find the gym industry appalling and just don't enjoy it. They're appalled by it. They're not comfortable in it. They're whatever. Mm. It might be. And I am very passionate about showing them that there's this movement thing that you potentially could be much more comfortable in. Yeah. And almost everyone who is a client of mine, that's the case for. Whether it's the child with autism who potentially in many aspects of society doesn't feel comfortable, but we can give them a space that they absolutely love. Or whether it's that's the person who's tried traditional gyms before and found it dead boring but now loves coming in here sort of thing I'm super passionate about that sort of thing if someone hasn't found a way to if someone wants to move and to be hit, fit and healthy but hasn't found a way to do that that speaks to them then I I'm all about helping that person yeah. find meaning through it because they're already looking for it yeah love it and I think most people are looking for it to some degree, they just don't know what's potentially. out there. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah. Oh, that, that might be a good place to wrap it up. I thought that was a beautiful uh, place, uh, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. So, <laughs> um, Very inspiring. So, <laughs> yeah. well, and, and also, one of my coaches is poking her head through like oh. the window, looking in, being like, Jack said he was going to be finished by 3.30. And, uh, <laughs> it's okay. It's now okay. 3.30. We, we, three. we don't have a session for another uh, 27 minutes. So. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well... Thanks again, man. That was really great. No worries. And, Thank um, you. I enjoyed I'm, it. I'm sure I'll come back for another movement session sometime. Sweet. You are Sweet. more than welcome. Thanks for listening, guys. Catch you next week.